I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with Pastor Christine Peebles. She has written a remarkable book, A Remarkable Exploration of Faith and Religion. It is called Behold the Lamb of God. Woe, woe, woe. The lion out of the tribe of Judah is coming. It is a thought-provoking exploration of biblical scriptures and prophecies that underscore the powerful imagery of the lion and the lamb. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Atticus Publishing for helping us put her in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like her by subscribing to our channel and purchasing this wonderful book. Pastor, thank you so much for being our guest today on Spotlight. You're quite welcome. Talk to me a little bit about the imagery in the book, the Lamb of God and the Lion out of the tribe of Judah. The Lamb of God, uh, he is no other than Jesus Christ. Uh, it was prophesied about him uh, in the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, uh, verse five, he said, he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with are healed. And then when you drop down to the seventh verse, it was talking about how he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and a lamb before his shears, and he was dumb because he opened not his mouth. Okay, Isaiah was prophesied, prophesying about Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and even before he prophesied about Christ, when we go back to the ninth chapter of the book of Isaiah, he said, unto us a child is born, a son is given. Okay, that child, that was being born was Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And you know, he came into the world for no other reason, but for the sins of the people. Mm -hmm. Jesus was in heaven on the right hand of his father. And the, the sin and the wickedness of the world, God looked down and he seen what a world needed a savior. He needed the world needed somebody to go on their bone. And you know, the Bible, Isaiah also describes us as being in prison. When he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the prisoners, unto them that are bound. Uh, the world needed a savior. And God, had only one begotten son. And the word of God let us know that it is a, a begotten son because it, he was not born through flesh and blood, but this was through the spirit, the Holy Ghost. And so he sent Jesus down here to suffer, to be rejected, to be hated, to be despised. And Jesus was willing to go through all of these things just for the sins of the people. And as Isaiah said, they led him to the slaughter and a lamb before his shears. Well, that is the way mm. that they did him. They pierced him. They, they, they beat him. They marked him. Uh, even when it came down to the part about his death. And let me back up a little bit and mm -hmm. talk about Isaiah also prophesied about John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. He said, a voice in the wilderness crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. And John the Baptist, when he came on the scene, and his mother and father, Joseph and Elizabeth, not Joseph, but Elizabeth. But anyhow, John the Baptist, 
He was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Mm. And he was preparing the way. He was at the river of Jordan and he was baptizing the people. And somebody wanted to know, uh, we heard that the Messiah is coming. Are you he? John said, no. He said, I'm the one that Isaiah prophesied about. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. He said, but there's one who is coming after me who is preferred before me. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And so John, he's out there and he's just baptizing, he's just baptizing. And Jesus is the light of the world. Well, I can't say, and then I will say, John seen a light hmm. and he stopped. And he told the people, he said, behold, God who come to take away the sin of the world. It is him whom I was telling you about. You see, John was just baptizing mm -hmm. unto repentance, but Jesus, the lamb of God, he had to die. He had to suffer and he had to die. And the word of God said through Peter, Jesus suffered and he died. And Peter, he went on to say, well, he told them in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, he was telling them, he said, uh, you were not redeemed with money or things of that sort as the things that come from your forefathers. He said, but you, re you were redeemed with the precious blood of the lamb. That's that lamb of God. And he had me on his mind. He had you. Mm -hmm. on Amen. And things got really, really kind of rough. He took some of the disciples and he went out into the gardens of Gethsemane. And uh, he told them, he said, uh, stay right here and watch while I go and pray. And so he went and prayed and he came back and they were asleep. Peter was among them and he woke them up. And he asked, he said, you couldn't watch with me one hour. Uh, and then he goes back again. And even at that time, I mean, the cup done got bitter. And he's saying, Father, remove this cup. Then he went on to say, not my will, but thine will be done. And when he went back, the next time, and he said, Father, if this cup cannot pass except I drink of it, not as I will, but as thou will. Then the third time, the flesh, he was, a, remember now, he was in a fleshly body. The flesh got weak, the flesh was in agony. And he fell down to the ground. And the Bible said that an angel strengthened him. And he got up and he went back to the disciples. And he woke them up. He said, uh, take your rest. He said, for the time of my departure he is at hand. And so Jesus, look at him. He's headed. And, and, and the hurtful part about it because he had 12 disciples with him. He sit to the table and he blessed bread and drank the fruit of the vine with them. And then he began to tell them, he say, one of you is a devil and you're going to betray me. 
Everybody want to know, is it our Lord? Is it our Lord? He said, the one that sought me, which it was Judas. And Peter, Jesus told Peter, because Peter said, I I'm willing to suffer with you. I'm willing to die with you. But the world did not need but one lamb of God. And that was Jesus. Amen. And Jesus, he told Peter, he said, before the crop crow, you'd be done denied me thrice. But Peter said, I'll never deny you. But Jesus, and I'm kind of skipping about a little bit, but Jesus, he's carrying that cross. And that cross had my sins on it, your sins on it, the sins of the whole world, him carrying that cross. And they did Jesus like they would have done the animal that is a lamb. They, they bruised him. They, at one point, they took his clothes off and they put a scarlet robe on him and they put a reed in his hand. Then they come back and they took the reed out of his hand and they took the scarlet robe, robe off of him and they divided, decided to divide it among themselves. And Jesus, they nailed him to the cross. But before they put him on that cross, they took the, they took the reed out of his hand and they smote him side the head. They smote him with the palm of their hand. But Jesus, he took all of that because the world needed a savior. The right without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission for sins. So his blood had to be shed. And his blood is what washes away our sins. The and it's the blood of the covenant also, correct? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, of course, it is the greatest story ever told, the story of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, the Son of God coming to earth and to save us, to save you, Pastor, to save me, to save generations before us and generations to come. And it's remarkable work that you've done here with this book, with your interpretation, with your analysis, and with your prose, what you've written here. The name of the book is Behold the Lamb of God, Woe, Woe, Woe. The Lion out of the tribe of Judah is coming. And of course, we'll leave them, our viewers today, with the best part of the story. After Christ was put through the mockery of a trial, betrayed and crucified. Three days later, he rose from the dead right. again to save us. Pastor, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Well, can I uh, tell a little bit about the lion out of the tribe of Judah? Sure, sure. We have a couple more minutes. Yes, please. Okay. okay. The lion out of the tribe of Judah. Uh, in the book of Revelations, chapter five, John seen a book. And it was written thereon, sealed with seven seals. And uh, John said, I looked in heaven, I looked upon the earth, I looked beneath the earth, and no one was found worthy to open the book, nor to even look on the book. And he said, I wept. He said, because no one was found worthy to look on the book or to open the book and loose the seven seals. Well, the book of the seven seals, this is the seven wraths and judgments of God that is going to come upon the land. And after John began to weep, 
Then one of the elders told John, he said, weep not. He said, for a lion out of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. And he shall open the book and loose the seven seals. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so Amen. those are the wraths and judgments of God. And maybe I have a little time to tell something else sure. that is in that book that is in the uh, last chapter, uh, The Lion Out of the Tribe of Judas Common. And uh, on page 89, it starts with the subject about having an encounter with the false prophet and the antichrist. Hmm. And God allowed these things to happen that I can share with the world that they can be aware of the false prophet and the antichrist. But in 1993, I met a young man. He was from Junction City, Kansas. And uh, nobody knew him from around in these areas. But I was doing tent revival over in Meta, Georgia. And this young man came to the tent every night. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Bible tells us in the book of John, 1 John, Epistle of John 4 and verse 3, he was talking about beware of the false prophet, prophet and the Antichrist. He said, you have heard that the Antichrist shall come. Well, it's already in the world. Well, God allowed me for the false prophet who had the spirit of Antichrist to live in my house. And he was a preacher. He was very, very, very wicked in my house. And I'm cutting it short. He worked witchcraft. He put it all over my clothes, the chairs and things of that sort. Uh, and this young man, and I had a daughter in the Lord. She had two children, two little girls. Mm. And she got, well, let me go through this. I, uh, after so much wickedness and stuff going on, and every time I got ready to put him out of my house, God said, no, not now. Mm. And so then finally, in December that year, I did, I called him in and I sit and I talked to him and I was telling him about the wickedness and stuff. I say, you put which in my house and on my things. And the first thing he asked, he said, what did it smell like? I said, well, it had a spicy smell and it had, a oily, it had oily spots. Uh, he said, I, I, I did not do that. I said, you did. I said, you even put it in my Jergens lotion. And I went and got the lotion and uh, he smelled it. He said, well, it smelled like Jergens lotion to me. Then I got the new bottle that I had had and he smelled it. And then he said, well, you got two other sons here. They have a lot of traffic in and out. I said, well, what kind of motive would they have to put witchcraft down for me? Mm. And uh, But anyway, I told him, I said, you got to go. Mm. I say, pack your clothes and go. So he left, but he never got upset or angry with me about anything that I confronted him with that mm. he was doing. And so uh, the young lady that was a daughter to me, we would come and pray. She had the two little girls. So he would come back to visit. And on Sundays at the church, she would be there with me. And so one Sunday he came back to visit and the little girl came and got in his lap and put her arms around his neck. I thought, I said, oh my God, he done got to her. Yeah. And this young lady, okay, he was ready to marry her. Mm. I tried to talk to her. I said, you don't need to marry him. I said, you don't know nothing about this man. I said, he come from Junction City, Kansas. And I say, uh, you don't know what kind of record was behind him. I said, but he's very, very evil. Mm. And she said, well, all I know, he is a man of God. And he said, we're going to travel the land and preach the gospel. And I'm going to help him. Mm. 
Hmm. And so she did. She went on and she married him. She got pregnant. And every time she got pregnant, he would leave. Mm -hmm. And then after the baby's born, come back. And I think it was about the third pregnancy, he left. Uh, and he gave me his mailing address and he sent me a picture. And he had on an army uniform. I said, oh, he's not in the army. He just borrowed somebody's JROTC uniform. But the address, he was stationing at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And mm. I'm familiar with that because my husband was in the army and was stationing there. Mm. But uh, anyway, and all of this came out after things happened. But they had six more children together. And December, November, 2004, She called him, okay, she had a baby, November. And it was the last baby, child number eight. Mm. And she called him in the bathroom, messing with her daughter. And she put him out, but some kind of way he got back in and he killed her. Oof. Awful, awful. Yes. and. And this is the awful part about it. He killed her and put her in a freezer. Yeah. And he kept right on preaching and doing revivals. And I was doing a revival uh, July 2008 in Louisville. And God showed me a preacher being brought out of, a, out of a church in handcuffs. Hmm. And the last of July, I seen this thing on the news. Hmm. Uh, the law went to the church and they stayed out in the lobby and they let him finish preaching. And on the news, you could hear him preaching and he was saying to his children, Forgive me for what I've done in the past. Forgive me for now. Forgive me for the future. And the law waited until he finished preaching. See, because the daughter had got a loose and went, got away, and she went to the police and she told them uh, that her stepfather had been abusing her ever since she was 11 years old. Amazing. And she told them, and he killed my mother. God. And they asked her, where is your mother? And she told them, she's back home in the freezer. Awful. Pure evil, pure evil indeed. You have both darkness and light in our interview today. You've told us about the wonderful power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've also talked to us about what evil there can be in this world. It's been a fascinating interview. Pastor, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. You're welcome. It was and my to the pleasure folks at, to be here. My pleasure to have you. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.